welcome or welcome back to my channel. A long time no video, but I am here to do my first semester recap of dental hygiene school. I just finished um, at the uh, beginning of this week. We just had conferences with our instructors, which was uh, a good way to end the semester. But um, I am wearing my O Dentistry t-shirt. It literally just has teeth and light bulbs and then it says O Dentistry at the bottom. I absolutely love it. Um, and I'm going to try to hit every class I went through, kind of what we learned what's going to come up for me next semester and kind of how I dealt with type 1 diabetes to the best of my ability with this program. Uh, for those of you that do not know, uh, dental hygiene is an extremely tough program and we have a very harsh grading system and if you miss so many clinical hours, so many lecture hours, it counts against you and it could result in you lowering your grade, which if you drop below a 78%, which is a C, you cannot continue in the program. The reason why this is, is because of accreditation. They have to approve to accreditation and to the state of Wisconsin that I've been in lecture hours and clinical hours so many times throughout my two years and I've had X amount of experiences and X amount of different uh, patients that I've seen, X amount of different x-rays I've taken, um, you name it, they have to prove that. And that's why they're so rigorous about attendance and stuff because if they're not accredited, like, I'm not going to be able to find a job because they want a place, a program that's accredited so that I can get both uh, my license uh, from nationally and uh, a state board also. I have to take two boards at the end of my um, end of my schooling here, which means that I have to take a national board, which is a written test, and then I have to take a state or a clinical board, which means I have to find a patient with so much tartar or calculus, and it has to be on this many different kind of teeth and I have to scale it in front of three different people and it's gonna be scary but anyways I'm gonna go through each of the classes kind of um, what the rundown was how I did and again how I dealt with type 1 diabetes so I will start with process one which process one literally is just um, clinic level one and process one was merely more of a pre-clinic building instrumentation skills um, we worked on each other quite a bit. We worked on mannequins quite a bit. Um, there was a lecture and a lab component. Lab was twice a week and lecture was once a week. And then this was my binder for process one. Um, and you could tell I'm very type A. Look how organized this is. But there's different categories in here about what each thing was. So like all the information is in here from all the different instruments we learned to oral hygiene habits to doing an intraoral and extra oral exam to um, stuff review for finals and boards, uh, how to chart restorations, how to chart different things in our Dentrix program, which is the dental program we will be using and which most places do use. Um, everything from diagrams to lecture and reading guides that show different components to instruments and what they are about um, because boards can ask us questions not only like clinically can I use this instrument but can I also know why it's used, what it's designed to do what it looks like microscopically kind of thing um, or with a cross section of the instrument. So I have all this information and there's no way that I'm tossing out any of our information because at any point, anything that I've learned from day one to the, my last day ever in dental hygiene school could be on my boards. So I have to keep everything and keep everything saved. So process one was weighted based upon our assessments um, in lecture, so like quizzes, final exams, and it also was <clears throat> graded based upon how we did clinically, either a clinical assessment like on a certain instrument, um, or TallyVal, which is a big, huge platform um, for dental hygiene and dental students in which if they look at different criteria and say you did really well in an area, you get a plus mark. If you made one mistake in that area, you get a check mark, and if you did a lot of mistakes or made critical errors like not uh, an infection control hazard, you didn't show up to class, um, you didn't recognize the need for a medical consult, and that's more for treating patients like people that have had a heart attack or a stroke within a certain amount of time. If I was going to treat a patient like that, say I knew somebody, they wanted to have a cleaning done by me, and I didn't get a medical consult for them, and I began cleaning on them, uh, that could be a big, huge critical error, which is a big red X in Tallyville. And Tallyville actually is compiled through all different dental hygiene schools across the nation. And uh, everything kind of gets averaged and weighted based upon that. And everything is weighted differently. And then it gets multiplied by a master compilation from, again, across all the different uh, schools in the nation for dental hygiene. 
and then that gets subtracted off what our median was. So we started out with 88% and I ended up with an 86.51, um, which is super duper good. I think I made like 12 errors the whole semester and there weren't, there were no critical errors. There were just like all little check marks like, oh, you missed this one time. But then I could see as I got further and further along in my clinicals, like how much better I was doing because I was putting in the time and the effort um, to practice. So that was my binder for it. And I will grab my books real quick. So these books actually will be used through uh, process or clinical levels two, three, and four. But this is the thick clinical practice of the dental hygiene student or dental hygienist. This book, let me tell you, weighs about 10 pounds. And I hated dragging it along with me, but it's full of a lot of great information. And um, this is one of the books we use. And the other book we used is more so like how to understand how to manipulate instruments, which is the fundamentals of periodontal instrumentation. Um, and advanced root instrumentation, which I believe we will learn second year how to root play, which is going to be super exciting. But anyways, there's all different information on how to do certain things and hold the instruments a certain way. And um, this is merely more for, I guess, first year. But I guess this could be more useful as you go further on in your career because there's a lot of advanced, like advanced root instrumentation to air polishing and all different things that we'll learn as we treat more and more difficult patients. Um, so those are the two books that we used for that class. And then of course, for the class, um, during mental health safety, which was my summer course on infection control, we got to implement a lot of that stuff into process level one or clinic level one, which is super cool. And then we had to buy master instrument kits. So we each get three kits that look like this. Kit A right now for first years always is a practice kit which means that we can carry it around with us, practice on a type of dot, or if you were like me, practice several hours on a mannequin outside of class just to get better at whatever instruments you're using. So I'll open up my instrument kit and just show you what's in here. So um, again, I'm gonna go more in depth about what these different instruments are, but they all these instruments are primarily um, used below the gum line and they're real gentle. Um, every single one of these is a curette except this instrument I got at my um, there was an indigo conference we went to here in the state of Wisconsin and there was a booth that you could get a free instrument at and I got this uh, it's called a Montana Jack scaler and this has got a point on it and this is primarily used above the gum line all these are used below the gum lines and these four in particular particular I use in people with really deep pockets like more receded gums or really really deep pockets where um, there could be tartar or plaque built up in there and then this other set is the other side of the kit and the kit kind of comes together and it clicks like this so when you open it up and I have two other kits like this um, a kit B and a kit C and when I come to process three and four for my second year of hygiene school this will turn into an actual usable kit it'll go through sterilization obviously before it goes in anybody else's mouth but in here we have the mirror are assessment instruments we have an explorer a probe another explorer and then these are our scalers very similar to the yellow instrument, but these are more specific. This one is for front teeth, and these are for the back teeth. Um, so that's what our instrument kits look like. And then they go together really simply like this, and then they just lock together. And they're super easy to lock up, put in, their, in the washer, and then go through sterilization. And then on each of our kits, um, they have A, B, and C. And then we have our dental hygiene number, which everybody is assigned a different number. And then they know who is who. And everybody actually gets different instrument colors. I'll show you mine. Um, if you didn't see my post on Instagram, I know some of you do follow me more. But my instruments are, <coughs> excuse me, I think I'm getting sick. My instruments are blue and red ended. Everybody's got different colors, again, so that we're not mixing up instruments between uh, our classmates. But um, I like my instrument colors. They're patriotic. I think it's kind of cool. Um, we didn't get to pick our colors. They just kind of got assigned to us. And at first I was kind of like bummed, but I'm like, you know what, I like blue and I like red, I guess. You know, they're patriotic, why not? Um, so whatever, a color is a color, it doesn't really matter what colors they are because these are just really my kits for hygiene school. And then when I get actually practicing, I'll get whatever instruments the dental office has. They'll look very similar, but they're not going to be specific colors or uh, specific looks. They'll just, I'll have to be able to know which instruments are what um, and stuff like that. But uh, process one, I got a B in, and it, again, it's a very, very hard class to get an A, um, no matter how hard you try, because Tallyvale 
will kind of drop you down because it's kind of an average between a lot of us. So the better you do, the better you are off. Um, but as a whole, I think our class is doing really well. Um, and I got like 1% away from an A, so I, you know what, doesn't really matter to me. But my biggest accomplishment was going out of process one and process two, three, and four, we have to do an exit exam, which means that we're given different situations with critical thinking level skills, depending on what level you're at. And it just kind of builds on each other. So I'll learn more. And then all anything from process one could apply into process two, three, or four. And anything in process two could be from process two or process one. So it doesn't really matter. It just kind of builds on each other. Um, so again, we do this clinical exit exam where we're different stations with different instruments kind of laid out. And they're not your instruments because um, some people will have a tendency to memorize their colors so that they know which area of the mouth belongs to which instrument side. I don't have my colors memorized. Not a smart idea if you're a dental hygiene student to not memorize your colors. Um, don't do that. I don't have mine memorized. I know what end is correct and what end is <clears throat> isn't by looking for different cues. Again, I'll talk more about this later. But we have this clinic exit exam. So you have different stations with instrumentation. Either you sit in front of an instructor and you're asked to do X amount of teeth and you either got it or you don't. And then there was an a station where there was actually all silver handled instruments with no colors on the end. And then we had to be able to pick them up and identify, hey, is this, this a curette? You're not gonna know these terms. A scaler, is this a explorer? Is this a, what kind of curette is this one? What kind of you know curette is that one? to be able to identify them based upon silver handles. It's a good skill to have because who knows where I'm gonna be working, what kind of handles they're gonna have. I'm not gonna be able to just look at it and go, oh, the purple handled one is my anterior scalar, which you've seen in my kit. I know that now, um, but it's important that you don't get that way because you don't know where you're gonna be working. You need to be able to know the instrument based upon what the end looks like. So, and then being to know where they go in the mouth. So I went through the whole entire thing and um, technically we weren't supposed to really know our scores, but I kind of got freaked out. One of my instructors came up to me, said my name, and I'm like having a heart attack practically thinking like I screwed something up or something happened. And she's like, we have never ever seen anybody get 100% on a clinical final. I said, you're kidding me. She goes, no, I got 100% on my clinical final. And I'm like, is this real? Like, did I really just do that? Um, but I, from week one, like I was always in the practice room practicing on the mannequins. And I would practice several times a week, no matter if it was required or not. For some of us, um, or actually for all of us at one point, after week nine, our instructor required us to do two hours of practice on the mannequins a week. Before that, I was doing it on my own time. So to me, I wasn't doing it for a grade or a requirement. I was doing it because I know and deep down inside, I want to be a better hygienist. And I really love practicing on the mannequins. I just love instrumenting, instrumenting and I love what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. And I practiced a lot. And I was always in the practice room, either by myself or maybe with a couple of my friends and just either guiding them or practicing on my own and just self-evaluating what I was doing right, what I was doing wrong and fix it and move on. And I was floored that I got 100% on this clinical final. And I knew eventually that like the hard work I put in was gonna pay off, whether or not it would have been treating patients um, or just in general, building up my strength in my hands or just, you know, getting better at getting the precise technique down. But I didn't think it was gonna pay off that quickly and I was gonna get 100 on this clinical final. Um, I was absolutely floored and I was actually talking to a second year student and that's like unheard of of anybody to get 100% on a clinical final. Um, so I don't know what I'm doing right, but I'm proud of myself considering I deal with a chronic condition and I deal with a lot of other things in my life and I definitely know that hard work and dedication does pay off and I'm proud of myself. I mean, I can give myself a pat on the back. I don't do that enough and I don't give myself enough credit for the amount of work I put into my schooling and I love it and I absolutely love the amount of coaching I've gotten from my instructors personal coaching to generalized coaching to just for them treating me like a you know like a really great person and you know treating me fairly and honestly even living with a condition that I live with and I couldn't ask for better instructors I have no complaints I am not worried I 
I feel safe when I'm at school. Like if something were to happen that they're going to be able to take care of me or they're going to do their best to take care of me and that they care about how I'm feeling. I know several times throughout the year they've always asked me if I felt okay, which is super nice. It's 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 nice knowing that they actually care about me as a person and not just a student trying to get pushed through and get licensed or whatever. Like they care about me as a person and they want to um make my experience as best as possible and they understand that living with a chronic illness can come with its ups and downs and just to feel like just to feel loved and, and cared for like it, it really means the world to me and I have no complaints I'm there's n I have nothing horrible to say about any of my instructors they are all super kind super sweet I God could have not have blessed me with better people to be educated by and God could not have blessed me to be with better students that I'm with and they're very, very accepting and very, very open to what I live with. And it's, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I honestly, and floors me how well I'm treated. And like I said, I can't stress enough. If you live with type one diabetes and you're watching my videos and you're going to college and you're not getting the appropriate accommodations or treatment or respect that you need, you need to talk to somebody because that's not fair. Like you should feel just as respected and treated the same as everybody else with the condition and you should also have that security knowing that like they are aware of the condition they're aware of maybe what you might be feeling and you know like they go out of their their way to ask me how i'm feeling like you know they don't even have to do that i i mainly just want them to know that like hey i have a condition if you're seeing these medical devices or seeing this that i'm not trying to cheat i'm not trying to do this i'm trying to take care of myself and if that means pulling out my insulin pump in the middle of class and giving myself a dose of insulin, I need to do that, I can do that. But they've gone above and beyond as far as treating me like gold, and I can't be more thankful for that. Um, so with that, I'm super proud of myself, 100% on a clinical final. That's, that's, that's crazy. Um, and I tease myself, I did worse on the lecture portion and got three wrong than I did on the clinical final, but... Um, I must have some damn good skills or something or my work is paying off because I'm like 100% like that's crazy like 100% like that's a, that I was just floored you know like I thought I did good but I didn't think like I did super stellar I thought maybe I missed like 10 points or something and got like an 85 out of 95 or an 85 out of 100 and not like 100 out of 100 or whatever I was just like kidoki I'll leave it at that but anyways that was process level one great class i had a good time in labs i had a good time in lecture i learned a lot and we're only going to build on each other in the process too so then now i'll talk about um ethics really quick which is a basic eight-week course learning the professionalism of a dental hygienist that was an eight-week course that we took and it actually is a course that was only that was really designed for last year students in their very last semester so like semester four process four students would take this um, but they recently for the first time this year have transitioned that to a first semester first year process level one course um, so I actually don't have my book with me I gave my book to a second year student I knew who was going to be taking it in her final semester um, because this is the last year that they're going to run it in the spring with a uh, second year student process four student um, who's ready to graduate um, but it was a really basic class it was enjoyable and it was done in eight weeks and I'm very glad I did I pulled out with an A um, again we got to learn more of the laws and principles behind the licensure of a dental hygienist to what can happen if you um, don't uh, don't uh, comply with certain regulations of a dental hygienist if you go outside your scope of practice aka if as a dental hygienist I decide to extract teeth that is not in my scope of practice that is not what I'm trained to do there could be consequences for that so that was that class and now I'll transition to talking about dental radiography, which is learning how to take x-rays. Dental radiography, this is the book we used. Um, this class was merely more lab-based, but we did have a lecture component also. And let's say the labs went by really fast, even though they were four hours a piece every week. Um, they went by super quick because you're constantly practicing on a mannequin. You may be practicing placement on each other. You're learning how to develop different techniques, understanding why this x-ray is better than that one, what you've done wrong in this x-ray, what you can do to make it better. 
and we took different kinds of x-rays we learned how to take bite wings which are people you might know it as your cavity detecting x-rays there's typically two x-rays taken on each side of your mouth every six to twelve months those are your bite wings we've learned how to take a full mouth series which is done typically every five years and that is a picture of every single tooth um you could actually it does like seven pictures across the top jaw and the bottom jaw so you get a clear picture of every tooth and the root of the tooth so that we can see if there's any issues with the bone which is super duper cool um and we also learned how to take a panoramic x-rays which are x-rays that if you've ever had one you bite down on a little tab and there's a machine that spins around your head and it takes almost like a smile picture and that allows us to see the jaw it allows us to see for kids especially or adolescents if wisdom teeth are coming in and they're going to be impacted or for again little kids who are losing teeth and growing in new teeth um we can kind of see if there's any issues with that um with their jaw development and stuff like that so we learned how to do all those and then we did a lot of that on the mannequins we did a lot of that uh placement on each other to understand like how to place the x-ray uh sensors in each other and everything's all digital with dental radiography now um i still had to learn some of the like film processing stuff the manual film processing and the regular film for boards and i was tested on it in class um but it, that's mainly for like if boards ask me a question on like the dark room or this error or that error with film processing like none of that is happening now it's literally a digital sensor that is triggered with a cord and you get your picture instantly it's actually really cool and it has definitely decreased the amount of radiation people are getting exposed to now for dental dentistry which is super nice and for this class we had to have three patients um three professional radiograph patients we had to take two full mouth series with bite wings um and then we had to take a panoramic and uh, let me tell you transitioning from a mannequin to a real person is definitely a challenge and i would agree with that with clinical skills too it is definitely the gum tissue is way different the jaw the mouth the cheeks the everything is way different night and day transitioning from a mannequin to a real person and at first you're kind of like trying to figure out a real person how to take an x-ray or how to instrument on them and then as you learn and grow as you develop your skills like it becomes easier each time you do it and it's kind of neat to see that progression just saying like oh my god like this was so hard for me now now it's like nothing to me to take an x-ray on somebody like to me it's nothing um to place it to line it up to do it and to do it quickly um whereas like at first you're kind of like with your first real patient you're kind of like i don't know what i'm doing but we're gonna try um, and but on my second patient, I did much better on the actual grading of the x-rays. I, I got an 83 on my first set of x-rays and an 89 on my second set, so I did way better. Um, but again, it's a learning process, and we're students, and we're going to make mistakes along the way. And um, it's good prep that we had to do these unreal people so that when we come to doing them with cleanings, and we also have additional uh, requirements for radiographs, for process too, which we can do on patients that we treat um, and for cleanings if, if they're due for x-rays or we have to find our own other patients that are just needing dental x-rays or people that have regular dentists that um, they can't afford to get a full mouth series or it's super expensive or insurance doesn't cover it, they can come see me as a student and get it at a much cheaper rate um, knowing that they're coming to an educational environment where I get to learn off of them, I get to take the x-rays, get my requirements met and then they get a set of x-rays to take to their dentist which is super cool. Um, in itself but I love taking x-rays I definitely didn't at first but I definitely love them now um, I like taking full mouth series as crazy as a lot of people would think um, if any of you are watching and are dental hygiene students and you don't like taking full mouths I'm sorry but I am obsessed with taking full mouth series and I would rather take a full mouth than a pan a pan to me is boring just like probing bores me okay if you're if you're in dentistry you know what I'm talking about I'd much rather use any other instrument but the probe, like I can do it, but it just bores me because it's just not as exciting to watch it go and move and see the results and see the just the neatness of different things. Not saying like I don't hate it, I just don't care for doing certain things right now. Maybe as I progress, I'll learn to like taking this kind of x-ray more and more or this kind of instrument more and more as I use it. Um, but to me, a full mouth series is so much more entertaining than taking a pan because... Um, I just find kind of kind of fun to put the sensor in somebody's mouth and I don't know I'm kind of different I guess but um I like taking full mouth series I like taking bite wings pans are okay um 
they're just rather annoying the sound they make <laughs> um and it's kind of a putsy to align a person up in a pan machine um because depending on the person's shoulders their height um their age like that can make a difference on how the pan turns out and you can make a flattened pan or a over exaggerated pan and that can really throw off diagnostics for a dentist so i feel like they're a little more harder to mess up i don't know in my opinion i think a pan's harder to mess up but i think a lot of people would say opposite um just because it's not as much for placement it's more of like placing the actual person instead of placement of the sensor in the mouth um but i feel like i'm much better at placing a sensor in somebody's mouth and taking a certain x-ray than i am at putting them in a machine making them stand there and watching the x-ray do it do you know the x-ray be automatic kind of thing but that was dental radiography we also learned how to identify restorations on x-rays and we also in dental radiography the lecture component we have to know the biological uh, radiology biology like learning like how radio um how um radiation can affect living uh tissues and the tissues within the human body um knowing kind of like what to look for on x-rays you know what landmarks on x-rays like looking at different anatomical landmarks on x-rays and being able to identify them based upon if they are white or dark um maybe looking at an x-ray and seeing like if it is um there's something kind of abnormal like we can't diagnose as dental hygienists but we can kind of like look and maybe say okay this doesn't look normal like there could be an issue with either decay or something you know maybe an old restoration is starting to wear or something like that um so we've got got to learn about those different things too which was a lot of fun and i will um show you my very thick binder yeah um this is like two inches worth of dental radiography stuff um but i got smart and only three weeks before the semester ended it i switched all my dental radiography stuff to a bigger binder i kind of feel stupid i should have switched it out faster um but we also had a workbook too that was very similar to the actual textbook um and i'll show that to you um i ordered mine online from amazon and it turned out to be a binder bond book and i'm not very i didn't really like it binder bond but my instructor loved it and she wanted to know the link to it so i kind of sent her that um but i wasn't a fan of having it binder bound but you know what it's okay it's kind of nice now that if i want to look at any of the information that we used out of the, the any of the worksheets we did out of here for boards or if i want to look at more further things in here that we didn't do i can actually do this really easily now um but that's that kind of stuff we learned um in dental radiography uh the lab portion again is much more entertaining than the actual lecture portion by a long shot um, I kind of wish I would have studied a little bit better for some of the lecture stuff. Um, I didn't definitely put as much effort into the lecture stuff. Still pulled up with an A in the class, but barely. I got like a 92 and a half, which rounds to a 93, which is an A. Um, but yeah, you want to see our... We got to make these placemats, and this is what kind of a full mouth series look like with all the different teeth. Um, and we got to color it, and each types of teeth are colored differently. Um, like these are your very, very back teeth. These are what you call, the pink ones are what we call premolars, your canines, and then your um, lateral incisors and your central incisors, which are your squared off front teeth that sit in the front here. So this is what this, um, a full mouth kind of looks like on somebody when it's taken properly. Um, this is actually the full mouth is top and bottom. And then these are the bite wings that go with it. These are your cavity detectors. But you can see like the full mouth actually shows the whole entire top part of the tooth and the whole entire root of the tooth which i'm more obsessed with taking um full mouths than i am a pan and then these are another set of bite wings called vertical bite wings which are very similar to these horizontal ones but these aren't done as much um unless the dentist specifically prescribes them or if the dentist wants to see more of the root in a bite wing you can do um, vertical bite wings and I actually prefer to take these because there's more chances for you to get all the teeth you need in a shot versus this you have less chances you have less chance to try to catch um, that canine tooth which is very important that you get the pointy teeth in the shot um, otherwise the dentist can't properly detect um, cavities uh, on your back teeth if you don't include that so I prefer taking the up and down vertical bite wings and I do the horizontal big time um, for that reason because you have a little more wiggle room with placement and if you don't mess if you mess something up 
a little bit, you've got a little more room and a chance to um, get all the teeth you need in the shot to uh, for the dentist to diagnose any type of uh, dental issues. I'll pull up a sheet really fast and show you what a pan looks like just from somebody else's or just a picture that we've had of a pan. Um, this is when we were talking about like being able to identify the age of a child and understanding what's primary dentition, which is your baby teeth and your permanent dentition, which is your adult teeth. So this is what a pan would look like on a kid. Um, and again, it shows more of a smile shape. You can see the different jaw structures and um, you can see here, um, all these little teeth underneath are the permanent teeth or the adult teeth that are forming underneath here and that are going to push the baby teeth out. Um, and you can see they're growing in some permanent teeth back here that are going to turn into the big molars eventually. Um, but I believe that, oh, if I'm not mistaken, this is second molar. Yep. So this child doesn't even have their wisdom teeth growing in or butted out yet. So this child is probably like five, maybe five-ish years old. And you could actually do a lot of age identification with looking at um, kids' teeth um, because there's a certain way that they develop um, in which we learned in anatomy class, the order in which they erupt, the order in which they develop in the womb and as a child. Um, so that's what a pan looks like. And that was pretty much all dental radiography was about. It was how to take an x-ray. Um, and we also emphasized uh, um, the regulations behind uh, radiographs and the safety uh, that you need to have with dental radiographs, like having a lead apron on the patient, which is extremely important to minimize their exposure. Um, me as the clinician or the, the radiographer needs to stand so many feet away from the x-ray so that I don't get excess radiation. Um, Using digital sensors are much better at reducing radiation than others. Um, keeping a certain angle between me and where the x-rays come out is also very, very helpful. Um, so like I said, there's a variety of different things that we had to learn and learn the safety behind and a lot of more lecture stuff than you would think for dental radiography. But that was a good class. Like I said, I enjoyed more of the actual lab part of it than the lecture, again, because it's more applicable to my career. It's like learning the actual techniques behind taking x-rays. Now I'm going to move on to my final class, Oral Anatomy. So Oral Anatomy, we used two different books. We used this dental-based book and the head and neck-based book. So dental anatomy and embryology and histology was learning all about everything to do with head and neck and the teeth and... Um, learning what this tooth looks like and um, the, all the muscles of the head and neck to the, all the bones of the head and neck, uh, the vascularity of the head and neck, how the, how things innervate in the mouth um, because it's very applicable to when we learn local anesthesia come our second, second year. Um, right before our final semester during January time, we're going to learn to give each other local anesthesia injections. In the state of Wisconsin, dental hygienists are able to um, be licensed to administer local anesthesia or your Novocaine shots. Uh, if you're going to get something numbed to get an extraction or go through a dental procedure, we are licensed to do that. So a lot of the stuff that we learn anatomically is very applicable to clinical, um, clinical settings. So we learned everything from dental terminology to teeth numbering. Um, each of your teeth have a different number to how to identify um, kids' teeth baby teeth versus adult teeth in the mouth and when kids are growing in their adult teeth and losing their baby teeth and knowing which teeth are the baby teeth, um, knowing the different types of landmarks and what different teeth look like radi radiographically, what do they look like, how many roots do they have, how much, um, how many ridges do they have, cusp tips, this kind of ridge, that kind of ridge. Um, what dents and enamel and pulp is all about, which is more applicable to our cariology course, which I'll be taking over January. Um, and then we also, just the last unit we learned was like how teeth are formed as a child, like in the womb or at how, you, how the teeth form and develop while the baby is still growing in the mom. And there's a lot to it and there's a lot of different medications that can affect the child's teeth, um, can cause different... Um, abnormalities or different um, uh, discolorations on the teeth if mother takes a certain type of antibiotic 
um, different medical conditions that result from malformation of like the actual facial bones or the palate, like cleft lip, um, and being able to recognize them clinically. And, you know, some people have, there's actually a little um, it's underneath your tongue. And if somebody can't stretch their tongue out very, very far, I can. I'm not tongue-tied, but ankyloglossia is something else that we need to look for in a patient. And that actually comes from forming in utero. If something didn't form or merge correctly, forming from the back to the front with the jaw structure or the soft tissues in the mouth, it can, it can cause all different things that we can see clinically. Um, so I really enjoyed the actual embryology unit. I think that was one of my favorites. I liked learning about the bones and the muscles. And that was a lot of information, knowing what muscle it was, where it originates, what it inserts, what its job is, um, all the different nerves, where they innervate certain teeth, certain areas in the mouth. And let me tell you, anatomy was a lot of work, but I love anatomy because I'm just one of these people that like understanding the science and the physiology behind things and why things work and why things work the way they do. Um, we learned how to identify different types of bite relationships when somebody bites their top and bottom jaw together. Do they have um, overbite? Do they have an underbite? Do their teeth cross over? Do their teeth look like they're not biting together on the front? Um, which is what we would call an open bite. We learned to identify what's normal biting on each side um, or what we would call normal occlusion or malocclusion. Um, FYI, I am malocclused on my left side, um, but that's for a different story for another day. We had to learn everything from knowing the vascularity and the lymphatic drainage of the head and neck because it's very important that if you don't have the proper drainage from your vascularity or your lymphatic system, you're not going to be able to prevent infections in the teeth. Um, and knowing where all these different lymph nodes are located and different um, su blood supply if I go to do a, a cancer screening on somebody and I miss mo going around underneath their throat like this and palpating down, I could miss a lymph node underneath their jaw, like a submental or a submandibular lymph node, and I could miss that. And I could miss something that's swollen, uh, and, and I have to note that because that could be a sign of something major or it could just be they're a little sick. Um, but if I don't know where different things are located anatomically in the head and neck, this big muscle, your sternoclinomastoid, if I don't know where any of these are located, I can't properly do an oral cancer screening on somebody. And I could miss things that could potentially be a warning sign for cancer or something that can, you know, a condition that needs to be looked at. And all these different things we're learning now, as much as it sounds silly to learn all these anatomics behind all the structures, like it's actually very, very applicable to looking at radiographs, to doing cancer screenings, to knowing what's normal inside for people when they bite down with their teeth, what's normal looking for a certain tooth to have this many roots or this many cusp tips, you know, because if there's something that's not quite there, you know, this could be an issue with a person's teeth or, you know, is there grinding present on their teeth? Is there wear on where the teeth meet when they chew down? Is there actually like a wear mark? Um, being able to recognize that, being able to recognize that like, um, there's these two little bumps that sit right at the top part of your jaw and those are called Stenson's ducts, which are salivary glands and um, knowing that when I do an oral cancer screening and I see that on a person, that is not abnormal. As a matter of fact, you could, mine are very prominent, um, but that's not abnormal and knowing that that is normal anatomics and also knowing that because of the salivary glands secreting saliva right on top of those teeth and under that gum tissue, there's more likely to be buildup of tartar and plaque um, because excess stuff just gets built up and built up and you might not be brushed properly at the back of the mouth and could lead to more uh, tartar or plaque buildup. Same down here, there's also um, salivary glands underneath your tongue and they can cause buildup of tartar on the front, on the bottom front of your teeth, kind of in between them or right by your tongue side. Um, and knowing that these normal anatomics can cause these different things and be uh, aware of different things that can happen clinically commonly because of these different anatomics is kind of a neat thing. And knowing that like if you see this, it's not abnormal, but it's not super common, it's super important to me. And like I said, I really enjoyed anatomy. 
got an A in the class. I worked my butt off in that class. Now that class is a lot of work, a lot of worksheets, a lot of reading, um, a lot of studying because there's continuous quizzes or continuous assignments. Um, but I really enjoyed oral anatomy and I love the specificity of oral anatomy that it was only the head and neck region. Um, before I got into my program, I had to take general anatomy, which was like all the everything in the body. But I really, really enjoyed this kind of class because it was very specific towards what I'm going for. And um, I love being in classes that are actually going to apply to my career now. And I love being in classes that are dental related. And um, anatomy was, again, probably one of my favorites this semester. That in process was probably my favorite classes. Um, I enjoyed them the most. Uh, and I did really well in all my classes. I pulled out with three A's and one B. And uh, I can tell you this, that don't let diabetes stop you from pursuing whatever dream you want. Um, you know, it was a challenge dealing with my medical condition. Um, but I wasn't scared to take insulin. I wasn't scared to reach out. And I definitely wasn't scared to check my blood sugar. And if it wasn't in the range I wanted, I would take insulin. Um, and, you know... For certain things, they would always ask me, do you need to eat? Are you okay? And oftentimes I'd be totally fine. Um, but to me, like when I'm doing my schooling, like as much as I don't want to say this, like I'm not not taking care of my diabetes, but when I'm like instrumenting on a mannequin, like in that moment, nothing else matters but my career and what I love doing. And um, I'm not neglecting taking care of myself, but I love what I'm doing so much is like taking my mind off a chronic condition for certain things is really enjoyable to me. And it means the world to me knowing that like, you know, I can balance a condition and, you know, do the dream that I want to do and treat patients and um, do something that I'm going to love for the rest of my life. And it really definitely suits me um the way I go about things the way I think the way I do things and apply things this definitely applies to me and this this career is going to be nothing but fun for me and I can't wait to see what semester two brings for me and um I'm super excited semester two is going to be a lot more classes we have clinic two or process two we have dental nutrition periodontology Cariology, which is in January, and then we have oral pathology in general, or oral pathology, which I think is going to be a good class. I really, I have a, I have a good feeling about pathology. I like any ology, and I feel like semester two is the class of ologies. Cariology, periodontology, general oral pathology, dental health nutrition. It's like, it's like ologies. Okay, how many ologies can you take? <laughs> um, but I love anything that has to do with an ology. I love anything that has to do with like science-based things I really like learning about and I feel like knowing that the science-based courses that I'm learning now are really going to apply to what I'm doing clinically is super cool and I've been able to see some of the stuff from oral anatomy apply clinically with my classmates and apply clinically with the way I'm treating patients and apply clinically the way I'm taking x-rays and what I see in my x-rays um, and what I'm doing on a mannequin corresponds very similar to what I'm doing on a person and it's really neat to see the application and to build and grow yourself and I've grown as a person in 15 weeks I can't believe that I'm on to semester two and I did so well and I got 100 on my clinical final I mean I I I blew everybody out of the water I guess with my performance and um I worked my ass off this semester if you want me to swear I just swore and I'm not going to um, continue to not work hard. I'm going to keep working hard. And anything worth doing is going to be hard. And um, I've got most of my patients locked down for semester two, which is nice, knowing that I've got everything pretty much met. Um, and that's about it. I am beyond happy with the career I've chosen. I'm beyond happy with the schooling I'm going for. I'm beyond happy where I've gone to college and my classmates and my instructors. They are all angels. Um, I love all my instructors from the bottom of my heart. They literally have made an impact on my life and um, they're forming me into one heck of a hygienist. I guess you could say that um, because I really enjoy learning from them and I feel like they're they've got a lot of good experience and they've got a lot of good clinical years behind them and I can't wait to pick their brains and learn some more things that they've gone through and um building me up to be this amazing person and this amazing hygienist who's gonna have um awesome experiences treating patients of a variety of different ages a variety of different 
uh, health conditions with a variety of different um, issues going on in their mouth to um, their difficulties and different things like that. I just can't wait. And um, onwards and upwards, cheers to semester two and cheers to me living with another year with type 1 diabetes. And um, I want to say thank you to those who have been patient with me and understanding why I'm not, wasn't able to get videos up as quickly as I would have liked to due to being in school. Like, um, if I wasn't doing YouTube, I was probably studying for anatomy or radiography or process, or I was probably spending two to three hours after class on a mannequin, um, trying to perfect my skills and, you know, understanding that I need to learn and build these skills and, um, that this is my career path that I've chosen. I really appreciate those that have just, y'all understand that I couldn't dedicate quite as much time to YouTube as I would have liked. And I'm going to be on here as much as I can now that I have a little bit of a leeway gap with Christmas break here, which is nice. I can crank out some videos for you guys. And um, I've got something special coming up for six and 700 subscribers. And I'm still floored away how much my life has changed in the last year and a half to starting dental hygiene school to having a channel with almost a thousand subscribers and, you know, just being so open about living with a chronic condition and just showing the world that you can do anything you want with this disease. Like, there's nothing that's going to stop me from doing whatever I want to do with type 1 diabetes. And it's such an amazing thing to be a part of this community. And I couldn't be more blessed to have great viewers and great people by my side in my life who are going to support me um, no matter what. And it's wonderful. <laughs> and I couldn't be more happy with the way my life is going right now. And yes, I do struggle with blood sugar some days and I do struggle with ups and downs just like everybody else but overall I am happy with the direction my life is leaning. I'm doing a lot of great things for a lot of great people and I am going to be one heck of a great hygienist who is going to take care of her patients and really educate them on the importance of what's going on in here can really make a difference of what's going on on your body. So um, anyways I hope you enjoyed this very long video of semester one recap of dental hygiene school. And if you did, give it a big thumbs up. Feel free to hit that subscribe button down below. I post videos every single week about diabetes plus more. Stay tuned. I have more videos coming out for you. Um, Advent with diabetes. I have some different videos coming out for that. I do have a couple more inspirational type videos coming out. Um, and I'm going to catch up on my two T1D with Maddie episodes, 11 and 12, that did not go up on the first of the month. I will get those out for you guys um, so that I can keep continuing with that uh, with this type of series on my channel. So anyways, until next time for another video, take care, God bless, be kind, spread positivity, and be thankful. I love you all from the bottom of my heart. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Bye, everyone.